Hi everyone, uh, Sophie and I just want to quickly sort of reintroduce ourselves and um, our unit. So um, we're based here in Sydney and we're running the unit um, with love. Oh, so do you. Oh yeah. Um, so we have started the unit um, with love and it has been partially sort of inspired by a project Anna and I have been working on here in Sydney called Scent, which was all about bringing more voices and sharing experiences and valuing, valuing lived experience. So I think we've tried to bring a bit of that into our event today and I hope that you take part and enjoy as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. Um, so Scent was a project of 100 ideas about space and um, the format valued writing and text equally, I mean, sorry, image and text equally. So there's always that big emphasis on the two working together and almost two plus two equals five sort of situation where they lift each other and up, up and make something bigger than you could imagine. Um, we're really excited to say that it'll be turned into a book um, published by Australian publisher Post and that um, it's been a really great sort of foundation of learning for our students as well. Mm -hmm. um, so just a little bit more about the unit. Um, we sort of, we took the summer school theme of care as this opportunity to examine how we connect with each other in this uncertain time um, and how not only we connect with each other, but with spaces and places. Um, and particularly thinking about that through love. And our unit has been exploring how, um, as architects, we represent these spaces and the ways in which we connect with others. Um, so last week we had a great series of guest run workshops where the students looked at writing, drawing, sound, the internet and touch. And this week through drawing and writing, the students will reflect on um, I guess the intimacy between themselves and the spaces they're in. And as a unit, we're working towards making a zine of illustrated, um, I guess, mixed medium letters to places that they love. Um, which brings us well to this evening's event. So tonight we seek to uncover connections between the event's guests, who I can't wait to introduce you to, and you, the event. Um, we're lucky to have four guest speakers join us to describe the quality of one object of their interior world using either a personal, historical or functional approach to explain a broader narrative of that object. So I think we've become quite close and observant of our interior world. We've all spent so much time inside. So what from there brings you joy and makes you feel a sense of love? Um, while this description takes place, the objects will remain off screen and we're inviting you all as our participants to draw your own interpretations of this description. It's kind of, we're trying to do like a life drawing class, but by words, because we can't all be stood around, a, um, you know, still life or whatever. So at the end of the event, um, sketches can be uploaded to a shared concept board. I'll send you the link in just one second. And um, so the idea is that no matter the distance between us, the speakers and you, the audience, will have an intimate description of a place and have interpreted this through drawing and we'll share that together. So it's about creating a shared world. Um, and so now to introduce our speakers. Uh, so firstly, we have um, Grace Motlock. Grace is co-director of Sydney Architectural Office, Other Architects. The practice seeks other approaches that challenge conventional wisdom, popular opinion and architectural trends. Grace is an appointed member of the New South Wales State Design Review Panel and teaches regularly within the Master of Architecture program at the University of Technology. Um, and then we will have um, Dr. Andrew Tolland. So Andrew is a senior lecturer in landscape architecture and the course director of the undergraduate landscape architecture program at UTS. Um, a transdisciplinary scholar of the natural and built environment. His research is focused on the capacity of landscape architecture to change how we view, understand and change our environmental realities. 
Um, we'll then have Kate Finning. So Kate is a graduate of the Architecture Association in London, where she completed her AA diploma under Pier Vittorio Aurelli and Maria Giaducci. Kate's built work and teaching centres on the architecture of housing and the domestic plan as an object. And then we'll um, conclude with Clement Lucrancio. Clement is the 2020 recipient of the Architecture Drawing Prize and is currently exhibiting in Architectural Drawing Not for Construction at A83 in Soho, New York. He is an external design critic at the University of Nottingham and has previously worked for Bernard Schumi in New York. He is a graduate of the Bartlett. So thank you all so much for joining us. And I think, um, I guess without further ado, we'll hand it over to you. So yeah, starting with Grace. Thank you. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, thanks Anna and Sophie for inviting me to present. I'm Grace, I'm a director of Other Architects or a practice based in Sydney. So Australians are a people in voluntary exile. We are in exile from ourselves, our history, our reality and our destiny. We will not truly be at home until we fully acknowledge whose home this is. I speak to you today from the homelands of the Gadigal people of the Eora, custodians of this land, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So generally speaking, we at Other Architects are interested in architecture that exhibits a certain type of attitude, one that anticipates and welcomes the influence of movable, common and mass produced objects. While typically cheap and ephemeral, these objects can contribute as much to everyday life as the weightiest and most enduring elements of architecture. And moreover, the recognition that objects are themselves part of architecture constitutes a disavowal of functionalism and may therefore make for spaces better suited to their eventual reuse, repurposing and renovation. So I'm going to start with, is there anything more joyful than the way that Edith Farnsworth occupied her house? The rattan blinds blocking out the sun, her objects on the joinery, and the rugs distributed around the space, the plants and furniture dispersed, a space for respite, a space that's her own. So more than ever at the moment, we're designing for places that people actually live in and feel comfortable doing so. And as lockdowns continue, our houses have accumulated more possessions as our lives have collapsed into a single room. We recently completed Highlands House, a dwelling for a couple two hours south of Sydney. And we conceived of this house as a single room demarcated by furniture. We wanted the owners to leave traces and evidence of their occupation in the house. The house is nestled into the landscape and takes, the cue, takes cues from the artist studio opposite. There is an ease of use to the house. And the different activities within the house, within the same room are designated by the objects of daily life. And furniture is free to move around as needed. And ultimately this house sits quietly in its place. So now to the object. Purchased by my partner's grandmother in the late 1940s or early 1950s, shortly after she arrived in Sydney 
as a Polish refugee. This object sat in the corner of our last apartment, seemingly without use. When we moved into our current home, it suggested itself as a coffee table. But it's an object in three parts and three sizes. A small shape, a middle shape, which is two times the small shape, a larger shape, which is the small and middle shape combined. Each part is slightly taller than the next, from smallest to largest. Each part can balance on top of the other or be nested as a single form. Its upper surface is dressed in veneer with tapered legs and brass feet below. When I want to film a lecture, I stack these parts vertically and place a camera on top. When I want to sit on the couch and drink tea, the nearest part of this object comes to me. A collection of plants housed in different pots live a tenuous existence on top. Each time I use the object, I relocate and rearrange them making a new scene. This is my object. Thanks, Grace. I think we'll probably um, allow people to just draw and look at the beautiful description on the screen until 20 past whatever hour it is where you are. And um, then we'll come back together and we'll hear from Dr. Andrew Toland. So three minutes, I guess, of drawing, and then we'll move on to our next little vignette.
Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. Um, so, Andrew, when you're ready. Hey, great. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Anna and Sophie, for organising this and for inviting me to be a part as well. It's really quite special to connect like this to the broader constellation of architectural culture, especially when we're back into a hard lockdown again in Sydney. Um, just as Grace did, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, whose land I'm speaking to you from. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land, land whose sovereignty has never been ceded. Oh, and um, my background is part of a 2001 video art by Sam, Sam Taylor Wood titled Still Life. So this object that I'm going to talk about is not quite an object. And it's also part of my kind of para interior world, I'd guess you'd say. It's both inside and outside, a daily link between the two. So apologies, Anna and Sophie, I'm already straying off brief here. Um, it's also as much a practice as an object, something that relies on a small series of acts, but not quite a ritual. The unproductive made productive. There's something joyful in its non-objectness, its matter without formness. Um, but I know that you need to translate words into drawings. So here is an ingredient list, as it were. Two to three banana skins, orange peel, coffee grounds, tea leaves, avocado skins, and seed, it all goes in apple cores and trimmings, a long forgotten Christmas pudding hidden in the back of the fridge, sweet potato peelings. That was this week's concoction at any rate. It's stone age old, this thing we do. The Acadians in Mesopotamia kept records of it on their cuneiform tablets, but I'm not that meticulous. My partner is constantly chiding me about never putting in enough brown. We mostly use torn up brown paper grocery bags. There aren't enough dead leaves in our tiny courtyard. And in any case, there's a nice symmetry to seeing everything that our lockdown supplies come in also being added to the pile. The soft plastics are annoying though. That's about the only thing that's standing between us and zero waste. If we were more virtuous, we could fix this by shopping only at the local farmer's market and the bulk goods store, but we're not. It's not a hippie thing. My parents, paragons of upper, mid, upper middle class, of the upper middle class who had certainly never been hippies do it too for some reason. So this also acts as a kind of daily connection to my childhood. Scraps collected in a plastic lunchbox container on the kitchen counter were tossed into an old concrete laundry tub up against the wall of the vegetable garden. Their house had once been an old home farmstead, of an old farm homestead. The veggie patch had long been abandoned and neglected, but the laundry tub still remained. The virtue of the laundry tub was that it had two compartments, so you could have one active pile on the go while the other side matured. It had a sheet of corrugated iron for a highly ineffective lid. The, rat, the rats got in all the time. Sometimes when you went out at night, a fat rat would scurry out and surprise you. Rats were a problem in our own one when we installed it. They dug under the sides of the bin so I had to surround the base with bricks. Then they climbed up the sides when it, and were trying to chew their way through the plastic. I'd find their little teeth marks in the morning. So I had to wrap the entire structure now in narrow gauge wire. It's practical, but a bit unsightly. Fortunately, the planting around the bin has now gone wild. The plants were a bit anemic for a long time, their roots and soil infected with a debilitating fungus. But the thing seems to have changed the soil chemistry in the surrounding zone too. Everything is flourishing again. Periodically, a stalk of Setananthi satosa pushes its way up through the pile like a strange ghostly white alien plant. 
completely devoid of chloroform. I have to prune them back into the pile, otherwise they'd push off the lid. One becomes attuned to the smells of the pile as if it's an expression of personality. There are good funks and bad funks. One also learns to monitor the ecology of the pile, its wildlife and hydrology. If the brown hasn't been forked through enough and the surface layers of the pile get too dry, there's an explosion in the Slater population. I think they're called wood lice in the UK. When I looked this up, I was intrigued to discover that they're not insects, but rather one of the few land-dwelling crustaceans, about two centimetres long with little blue-gray segmented armoured plates on their back, rather like the segments of a lobster's tail. I like the idea of the pile containing this strange throwback to deep time, a Cretaceous throwback to an era when life was emerging from the sea to colonise the land. The fungal inhabitants of the pile are a bit like this too. The same dusty grey-green mould that blooms on oranges when they're left too long in the fruit bowl goes crazy in the pile when it hasn't been stirred for long enough. Penicillium digitatum, from the same genus of fungi that led to the discovery of penicillin antibiotics, and also to blue cheese. In Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman has a poem titled this square brackets object, insert object here. The second section begins, behold this square brackets object, behold it well. Perhaps every mite has once formed part of a sick person, yet behold, the grass of spring colours the prairies, the bean bursts noiselessly through the mould in the garden, the delicate spear of the onion pierces upward, the apple buds cluster together on the apple branches. The resurrection of wheat appears with pale visage out of its graves. The tinge awakes over the willow tree and the mulberry tree. The he birds carol mornings and evenings while the she bird sits on their nests. The young of poultry break through the hatched eggs. The newborn of animals appear. The calf is dropped from the cow, the colt from the mare. Out of its little hill faithfully rise the potatoes, dark green leaves. Out of its hill rises yellow maize stalk, the lilac blooms in the dooryards. The summer growth is innocent and disdainful above all those strata of sour dead. More to draw there than in my description, I know, but such is the genius of poets. Building out of, from the Whitman poem, a 2002 anthology, this square brackets insert object here, Ecological Imperatives in American Poetry begins with an essay by its editor, Jed, Jed Rasullo. Rasullo opens by invoking the American poet, essayist and environmental activist, Gary Snyder, who wrote, all our literatures are leavings and connects Snyder's observation to an even earlier one by Henry, Henry David Thoreau, that famous early environmentalist and writer, Decayed literature makes the richest of all soils. The implication is that the slow dissolution and commingling of literary parts creates more fertile ground. I wonder whether that's true of drawing too, or architecture. Not in the postmodernist sense, but something would invite a misinterpretation to say organic here, but something more quietly, somberly, messily blended. After decades of accelerationism and then the spectacular crash, perhaps something more comes of the coming apart. At a broader scale, the pandemic has felt a little bit like that generally, a moment of pathogenically enforced global entropy, a halt in that sense of a world of future rushing precipitously forwards, a turn inwards, an involution, a global pause, a hiatus out of which surely we all hope something better might emerge. Our object collecting bin sits in the corner of the kitchen, a prosaic gray plastic rectangle with a green lid. It was a pragmatic purchase from the hardware store and still insists on signaling its eco-ness. There's a kind of liberation in just being able to chuck pretty much anything in there. Some people are incredibly precise about their proportions, attempting to achieve the optimum profile for maximum decomposition, but we've tended to discover that it pretty much all works itself out with only minor adjustments and regular turning. It's 
possible to do this entirely indoors. The New York Times had an article on this as a suggested pandemic activity because the municipal authorities had halted their curbside collection program because of the coronavirus outbreak. Unsurprisingly, this turns out to be a Japanese technique. You can do it in a cardboard box and it's meant to be odor free, but it requires coconut peat and rice cusk ash. Um, but I'm quite into the smell. Smell is a nice way to judge its moods. In the, um, early in the pandemic, we succumbed to the mania for sourdough bread baking. And so on baking preparation days, the kitchen smells strongly of the sharp acridness of the sourdough starter discards. We got the sourdough starter from a friend in this instance, but there's also something appealing and parallel to the process um, of the object in the slightly magical idea of getting the starter started simply by waiting for bacteria and fungi to alight from the surrounding air. Our pand pandemic isolation has been filled with other fermentation fantasies, making our own kimchi. I love that some Korean houses have their own refrigerated kimchi drawer, although these appear difficult to obtain in Australia. We're also addicted to natto, which Anthony Bourdain described as an unbelievably foul, rank, slimy, glutinous, and stringy goop of fermented soybeans. The biggest problem with this is that the commercially available natto comes in individually portioned styrofoam containers. We eat a lot of it, so we produce an inordinate amount of styrofoam waste that entirely cancels out all the eco-virtuousness of our square brackets objecting. The only problem with making natto yourself is that it's incredibly foul smelling. We haven't found a way to solve this yet. I do have plans to build a kitchen cupboard with an airtight seal, but so far this is just another unrealized COVID project. In the meantime, the object is enough to satisfy my urges for fascinating decay. There's always a fear that space in the pile is about to run out and we'll have to find room to start a new pile. So far, rather magically, it always seems to metabolize enough that the level goes down and we can just keep topping it up. I like this steady stateness. The pandemic has done weird things to our culture of consumption. I'm certainly more prone to strange online impulse buying, but the object holds out the promise of something a little more circular. If not a fully circular economy, then certainly a kind of cycle of life in, micro, in microcosm. There's a daily joy in that, and more than just a little of memento mori. Thanks. Wow, Andrew, thank you so much. That was like a beautiful poem. Um, I guess we can wait for like two minutes, so 35 past whatever hour, and then we will move on to Kate. But thank you, Andrew, that was beautifully, beautifully spoken. And um, for those of us who joined us a little bit late to just re-explain um, the idea. So each speaker will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes describing a particular object. And um, we ask you as the guests to draw that object and um, place it on the concept board. So we can all kind of share and connect these um, different worlds in which we're living in. So nice to see so many little mice or mouses or whatever flying around on the concept board.
Okay. Um, should we move on to Kate? Um, hello, um, my name is Kate Finney and I'm an architect uh, practicing in Melbourne. Um, and there's really only one object in my interior that kind of leaps out and demands a kind of uh, explanation, I guess. Um, but I'd also like to describe um, a little about it while also telling you how it came into my possession. So I spotted you on eBay not in the designer section. And I can't imagine what terms I searched when I found you, but the attraction was immediate. There you were, empty and ready for my use at a mere $20 listed by the seller Betty Boo 82. What a bargain, what a joy, proof that ownership of richness in the material world did not always correlate with price. Your expression was of Memphis, Denise Scott Brown, or Andy Warhol, but you also none of these things. You were your own thing, and I wanted you to be mine. I messaged Betty Boo to make an offer and mentioned that it'd be a week before I made the pickup as you were located a nine hour drive from my home. So I'd have to drive. No, I wanted to drive. It seemed like the perfectly disproportionate response to a $20 online purchase. While at family dinner the following week, I mentioned my trip to my family. And although I was sure my car would be sufficiently large, I didn't want to risk it. My brother offered to lend me his four wheel drive, which would be perfect. Maybe I'd pick up some other things along the way. As details emerged of the reason for my trip, my family were reluctant to support my journey. You're going to a stranger's house you met online? It's in Western Sydney by yourself? We had relatives in Sydney, maybe they could help me pick it up. I guess I hadn't imagined that anyone with a holy lilac colored item in their ownership could hold anything but good intent. It's a woman, I said, but I didn't have time to fight for women's rights or to explain that while I understood their point, this, it was far more important that I picked up this item and I was willing to take my chances. And so I left, me driving, I'd driven to Sydney before, it was no biggie, and I'd stay in Canberra overnight. I was excited, and the thrill of the adventure cut through the monotony of the endless straight flat roads, and I consumed sweet iced coffee and Adam Caruso YouTubes to enliven my trip. That evening, I made it to Canberra, more than halfway through my trip, where downtown is a shopping mall, and I ate some vegetarian char kway teow. I was still agitated by the argument I'd had with my parents before I'd left, and the six hours of ruminating hadn't helped. The next day in Canberra, I filled my day with lunch at suburban bakeries, office furniture sales, and browsed the wares of charity stores. So far, my trip had been a success, but my agitation was building. Maybe the absurdity of my adventure had worn off or the 12 hour drive I had left just seemed insurmountable. After all, maybe my family were right. What was a young woman doing alone on such a chase? So with tears, uh, I decided to turn back home. Your three uh, tapered shelves and shaggy crown along your wits were not enough to will me to push on. Plus, I'd already exhausted my energy for secondhand novelties, so the thought of acquiring you was losing appeal. An hour into my return home, I stopped at a highway petrol station in Yass, a small valley of 16,000 people, to refuel and top up on snacks. There was no question I'd been beat, but I thought that knowing when to quit was just as important as sustained determination. And after all, you were nothing but mass produce, probably spray painted in an assembly line of hundreds and your aura was uh, wearing off. So as I willed myself into fresh energy for my return home, I started to imagine filling the corner in my house which I'd reserved for you with other things. I paid for my fuel and returned to the four wheel drive. I turned the key and it turned, but never over. The car wouldn't start, but I didn't stress. The car was a 2006 model and I knew it had a temperament, but I was patient and willing to wait. 
I turned and turned again before it became clear to both the car and myself that it was not going to start. My agitation turned to rage, but I kept it on the inside and called my brother, a mechanic who had loaned me the dud. He told me it was an electrical fault, that the engine didn't know the transmission was out of gear, so it wouldn't start. I'd, sus I'd suspected the car was NQR before I'd left. The sun was setting and I was rushed to get the car moving, despite its handbrake being engaged and also the petrol station attendant telling me I couldn't leave it at the Bowser. I called some towing companies who, whose quotes would send your price into the hundreds. My brother said he knew a guy coming down from Queensland with an empty tow truck and despite sounding very shady, he was willing to pay him cash and I wouldn't have to do anything further. In the meantime, I organized the car to be towed and waited for my taxi. I sat inside the station and got to know its characters. It was now dark and they were serving roast dinner from a bain marie. The clientele were all male and their breaks from on their brakes from driving cargo down the highway. My taxi arrived soon, and soon after getting in, I felt that keen sense of danger my family had been fearing. An hour long, long drive back to the city in the night's darkness on a two-way road, the potential risks were numbered. Kangaroos, wildlife, the driver, whose attention to the task I was beginning to question. I wondered how your floral ornament, multi-scalar in the most playful way had gotten me into such a situation. And so I was back in Canberra, well and truly over your seduction. There was still a few legs left for me to get home, airport, hotel and flight. Your price was now in the thousands. My flight and return home were uneventful and I had nothing to show uh, for my troubles. And so I was home and safe. And in the following days, I started to imagine life without you, but there was something about your rounded edges that I couldn't shake. I was fixated, obsessed. This was an itch I was gonna have to scratch. And so I thought, if I was happy to go to a stranger's house to pick you up, why couldn't I get another stranger to pick you up and bring you to my house? So for $100, I hired a subcontractor from Airtasker to make the trip on my behalf. Hopefully they'd have more luck. I messaged Betty Boo to make the arrangements and after some complications and mixed arrangements, you were finally on your way. And so you arrived a week later in the morning at 7.05 a.m., earlier than I expected and measuring a beautiful 70 centimetres by 90 by 35 a sweet and cheerful addition to my home. They say it takes a village to raise a child and it took a small one to bring you to me. If I brought a date home, I'd tell them the story of our journey as we sat together in our living room. It's either a tale of superficiality or blind determination. Nevertheless, my aim was to impress them. But I got a good review and the value is sentimental to say the least. So you'll never guess, but yesterday I spotted an item on eBay, not in the designer section, and I can't imagine what search terms I entered to find it, but the attraction was immediate. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kate. That was great. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll give everyone again like two minutes just to kind of collect their thoughts and um, put together Kate's story um, and post their drawing to the concept board and then we'll move on to our final speaker.
Okay, awesome. Maybe we will now welcome our final speaker, Clement, who will share something from his interior world. Um, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I'd like to thank Sophie and Anna for so kindly inviting me uh, to this wonderful event. Um, so I'm Clement, and I'd just like to give you a, a short introduction uh, of myself in addition to, to um, what Sophie and Anna said. Um, I think I'll start by maybe sharing screen. Okay. Um, so I'm Filipino uh, and I was born in France, where I'm now calling you from. Uh, in parallel to being a visiting critic and teaching, I also work on my uh, architectural drawing practice. Um, and maybe to give you a small insight into uh, drawing spatial fictions, uh, I've gathered a couple drawings that could maybe explain a bit more about it. So I'm interested in the poetics of space, the intangible atmospheres which our bodies perceive, um, but also in creating drawings of spaces which evoke an embodied reaction within us and to give space for one to dwell within the drawn space and to, wa and to wander within it. Also through these spat spatial fictions, I hope to encourage the viewer to slow down and to contemplate. At another level, I explore time, the anachronistic qualities of spatial memories, and even labyrinths. About the exploring of possibilities of an architectural drawing which conveys atmosphere and storytelling, so that the viewer becomes the protagonist of the drawn fiction. Uh, I often draw with graphite pencils, and I feel that there's something that connects us to, to this drawn space using the pencil, but also because it's a medium which we've all you know, had experience in handling at some point in our lives. So I think I'll leave you with this uh, black screen to then talk about this description of my object. So it's a description in the form of a story which uh, describes the object and the spaces around it, the spaces which it, it inhabited. And uh, the, the description will be about seven to eight minutes. Okay. This object has been sitting on my desk for almost a year now. It has become part of my usual backdrop of books, ornaments, and paperweights. I don't look at it every day, but it sits at the cusp of my peripheral vision. Occasionally, I shift my eyes and it flashes in focus. Knowing that it's there next to me makes me feel reassured. In reality, though, I rarely spent time to really look at it even before I placed it where, it where it now sits. Perhaps because my hands hold a better image of it compared to my eyes who only know of its silhouette. It had, however, traveled a long way before arriving here, even before it landed in my possession, or at least that's what I believe. The room was dark with only the dim moon illuminating this interior, bathing the space in a cold bluish tone. The object happened to line up with the light of the celestial body above. Perfectly illuminated, it stood out from the rest of the trinkets on my desk. I carefully picked it up and gently placed it in the palm of my right hand. It was cold to the touch and felt somewhat refreshing in this warm summer night. It was small and somewhat thin and weighed a little more than two pound coin. Though its value to me was so much more than that, priceless. In all this time, it had remained the same. Its dark grayish hue never faded. I tilted the object so that the moonlight shone on its surface. Minuscule specks embedded within it, no bigger than a grain of sand, reflected a bright light. It was as if I were staring at distant stars sprinkled across the cosmos, light years separating each light. I angled it slightly to the point where the cosmos disappeared. Instead, shifting grooves surfaced like ridges of a tall cliff edge. They looked like fissures and they lined up with the wrinkles of my hand. I brought the object nearer to my eyes. I don't remember it being so close to my face. It's the first time I actually inspected the object and it looked quite foreign. But as soon as I clasped my right hand shut, the object once again felt familiar. 
I was transported to another time, a year and six months ago, a cool February evening. You had just picked up the object and gave it to me as a gift. Instinctively, I raised my right hand and held it tight. It was cold then and having our hands outside in the bitter London evening made a shiver. So I placed it in my jacket pocket where it would stay for many months. Whenever I wore that jacket out, I would stick my hands in my pocket where my fingers eventually always found the object and held it tight. Who would have thought that this object would hold so much? In that moment, it had transformed from being a random object we had just both come across to becoming a symbol of our deep connection. I slowly untangled my fingers and found myself back in the room. Gently tilting my right hand, I let gravity pull the object into the palm of my left hand. By now, the object had warmed to my temperature. I looked back at my other now empty hand. The object left its imprint. Its oval outline marked by its sharp edges inscribed themselves into my flesh. It was made of a strong material, unmalleable, elemental. It had not broken my skin, though I'm sure it is very much capable of it. Bringing the object to my eye level again, I realized that it was in fact made up of layers. On some sides, they appeared paper thin, on others, no, no thicker than a penny. They are tightly compressed, like a tree's rings. Perhaps they tell of its age. I feel it to be old, much older than me, older than most. Material evidence of time passing. The object disappeared behind my fingers and my left hand felt complete once again. My thumb moved across its surface naturally, finding the groove it was so familiar with in the past. As if this object was the missing piece of the puzzle and I remembered once again. This time I was in this very room but many months ago. I had since traveled back home on the other side of the channel. It wasn't until the warmer months arrived that I finally had the sense to unpack my belongings and keep my winter wear in the closet. I made sure to empty out the pockets of other clothes where I found old receipts, a couple pennies, and a forgotten pencil. With my left hand, I reached into the pocket of this jacket when I was once again reacquainted with the object. Without taking it out, I immediately knew what it was. Simply by holding it in the palm of my hand, all those memories resurfaced. I remembered the warmth, the joy, the laughter we shared. I wanted to always remember, so I cleared my messy desk and placed it in the spot which I had just picked it up from. I found myself back to the present in this warm summer's night. I noticed a small nook hidden within its edge, an opening between two layers, just large enough to fit a fingernail. Suddenly, with the small pressure I applied, the object fell out of my hands and landed on the table. The sound it made as it hit the surface sounded like the clattering of precious porcelain. The object had split into two clean pieces, one larger than the other, though the smaller one was dangerously sharp. I picked up both pieces carefully and reassembled them. Luckily, the pieces fit snugly within the other, with only a hairline showing the fracture. Visibly, the object had altered, but the memories it holds are still ever present. It has become a totem, a time capsule, a reminder. These could not be engraved upon its surface, but they are visible to me, and they are what links me to this object and then to you. With love, C. That was beautiful, Clement. Thank you so much. Um, I think if we just have like two minutes again to wrap up and then I'd love for a little bit of a reveal if everybody <laughs> would like share what they were talking about, but maybe just in a couple of minutes. Um, and then we yeah. have the, um, the concept board, which is getting some nice drawings on there. Good luck, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and if you haven't already, upload um, your drawing and I'll repost that link again.
All right. I guess we'll call it there for the drawing part, the drawing and listening part of the evening. Mm -hmm. I hope that you all um, enjoyed listening to these four amazing descriptions. Thank you, Grace, Andrew, Kate, and Clement for sharing some beautiful words about an interior world and something that brings you joy. I'm genuinely curious about a few of them. Um, so yeah, it was a great um, set as well. I feel like um, we went on lots of different stories. Um, I've heard lots of different stories um, and different ways of talking about objects as well, which is fantastic. So thank you to all of you um, for participating today. Um, I guess if we want to just, if you guys are comfortable to tell us what you were talking about, um, that would be good for um, Grace, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I can show you a photo as well if you want. Oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a, the nesting tables mm. in the living room with the collection of plants on top of them. They're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. They're very useful. They're kind of like they're a little bit shabby in some places, but being able to move something around the room has been fantastic. We want to make more of them and have like a collection of them in the living room that we can <laughs> rotate around the room when we need them. Cool idea. I have a set of nesting tables from my grandma and they are so useful. Like yeah. we should bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, maybe I'll share my screen and we can have a look at the board, which yeah. has seen your little bit on it. Um, Interpretation. <laughs> I'm so um, thankful to everyone who's participated and um, thrown something up on the board. I know it can be daunting, but so nice when we all share together. Um, so this is for you, Grace. Quite a few nesting tables here, so good description. A lamp. This is good. Yeah, there's some. Can be something moving out. Work as a coffee table, I guess. They look good. Nice. Cool. Yeah, I feel like there's some quite accurate drawings. <laughs> some of them really <laughs> nailed it. Yeah. This is cute. <laughs> that one. <laughs> cool. Great. Um, okay. I think Andrew. Andrew? Like to reveal. Yeah, mine was probably the least cryptic. Um, and I don't have a photo. I saw Kate dashing off and I thought, uh oh, I don't think it's pitch black outside. I don't think I'm going to. So it was my compost pile, obviously, that I was talking about. Um, and it's also, it's also not very kind of, um, it's just a kind of black square of plastic, basically. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, what goes on inside that's the exciting stuff. That's great. Have you written about compost before? You made garbage sound so glamorous and poetic. <laughs> I'm a bit obsessed with writing about garbage. It's true. Not not personal writing. But I'm a bit of a collector of writing about garbage, so that might have had a, had a subtle influence. There's, oh, there's yeah, some great... I found myself drawing like the insides, all, all the things being composted. Yeah. Um, you no, I haven't actually uploaded my drawings. They just <laughs> but yeah. This is amazing. Whoever drew this um on right into concept board, that's very good. Whoever did that. <laughs> I have like no skills drawing online like that. So good. Um I got really captivated by the idea of the fat rat. I was like, wow, that's so cute. <laughs> like ratatouille or something. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, great. Green, gray. Nice one. 
Ah, okay. Thanks, um, Andrew. Kate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Mm-hmm. Kate, I'm actually, your, the board for you is a lot of like cars. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Can you tell? Yeah, I I was hoping I wouldn't have to show you. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. I can it. see how your parents um doubted you though. There's some cute floral things here. Yeah, there's a broken heart. That's funny. Yeah, that's so sad. (laughs) The clock. This incredible thing. Mm. Oh my gosh, it's close. That's, yeah, yeah, very accurate. Yeah. Good on you, that person. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, okay, the floral thing really came through, I guess. Mm. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. And full drives. <laughs> yeah, full drives and um, flaps. Nice one. That was truly cryptic. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And I guess we'll finish now with um, Glenna. So can you tell us? Okay. Um, so mine is just a very uh, banal slate rock that, that traveled oh, from... Um, uh, well, I, I, we found it in, in London and then it, it traveled with me, but it wasn't until I, I was wrecking my brain as to what object I had to kind of describe that it then chipped off. So then that's, you know, an, another added story to, to, to this piece of stone. So that's, uh, that's my object. Wow. Really great object. <laughs> you described it so well. I was thinking it might be one of those, like, you know those rubbers that you can like squeeze and change the shape of, like a kneadable rubber? I was thinking, oh, yeah. that would be something you might have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for a while I thought it might have been a pencil, but then I, I, yeah. I realized it wasn't. And I was I like, did try to keep it. I did try to keep it as um, uh, kind of elusive as possible. Mm-hmm. Good work. <laughs> yeah, screen um, again. Share. Okay. Time. Oh, mm. I feel like the hand really came through well. Yeah. Here. Yeah, something you can yeah, hold. Like table. That's nice. What do you think that is a little bird. Time, time. That is a good drawing. Mysterious object. <laughs> In hand. <laughs> Oh, this is kind of a bit like a rock. Whoever did that. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. Crazy that, oh no, it's the same picture twice. I was gonna say crazy that two people did a um octagonal timepiece. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Stop share. Okay, well, I guess that um is pretty much close to the finish of our public program, A Shared World. Um, mm-hmm. I hope that you enjoyed it, uh, whether you're a participant drawing or whether you're one of our fabulous guests speaking. Um, we hope that it was kind of a calm, inviting, inclusive look into different ways of seeing and experiencing the world. Yeah, um, and we hope you enjoyed being a part of it. Um, maybe before we wrap up, we're happy to kind of take any questions, um, particularly from our students or anyone else, um, but then we might conclude. Okay, well, <laughs> that is a perfect place to finish. And so thanks again for coming. Thank you for drawing and thanks for being part of it. I think it was actually a beautiful moment and the concept board and the drawing shared there are really sweet and kind of a nice way of being together, I guess. Um, Hmm. And 
yeah, and also thanks, I guess, to Bia for organizing the event for us. Thank you so much. And yes, yeah, we really appreciate it. We really do. Um, thanks thank everyone. You. Thanks so much. Have a great evening or day. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.